Well, hello and welcome everyone to this evening's event or perhaps this morning's event, depending on where you are. We are here to discuss climate, God and uncertainty, a transcendental naturalistic approach to Bruno Latour hosted by the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Now the agenda for this evening, it, we will start with a roughly 40 minute talk followed by the opportunity for questions and answers with our guest, and then we will be finishing up by seven o'clock. Now, as our guest speaker tonight, we are really fortunate to be welcoming Professor Arthur Peterson, who is a professor of science, technology, and public policy at University College London. He is also the editor of Zygon, the most important journal in science and religion, and he has an extremely distinguished career. He has been teaching in London since 2014, after more than 13 years work as a scientific advisor on environment and infrastructure policy within the Dutch government. So he served as chief scientist of the PBL Netherlands Environment Assessment Agency, from 2011 to 2014, and he has been a research affiliate at MIT since 2009. Now, as if all of that was not enough, he is also a lifelong learner in the best of possible ways. He has not one, not two, but three doctorates. Uh, the first was in physics in atmospheric sciences, the second was in philosophy of science, and just last year he completed a third in science and religion, working under Alistair McGrath. Now, I've had the great pleasure to know Professor Peterson for many years, and I can confidently say that in addition to the responsibilities and achievements I've already noted, he is a generous and supportive scholar who is constantly at work to make the world and the academy a better place. So thank you so much for being here tonight and for introducing us to the themes that are in the new book you've just written, which I believe is under review at UCL Press. So Professor Peterson, I hand over to you. Many thanks, Bethany, and many thanks, all participants. Um, many people I know there, which is really good to see. Um, what I want to talk about uh, today is indeed the, the book that I've written. Um, and I've had the pleasure to be able to do that um, as part of my job as a professor in London with this title, of climate change, God and uncertainty, and I will I will touch on um, the title, and I will explain um, in the short time I have um, what the approach is, the philosophical approach um, under climate change uh, that I think was it is inspired by the work of uh, Bruno Latour, and if we talk about climate, we have to start with recognizing the uncertainties that are there from the causal chain that's there from what is causing climate change in terms of the underlying structures of people and economy what they emit in terms of greenhouse gases what the consequences of those greenhouse gases are um, both globally and especially also regionally i want to put a lens and I want to look at kind of the multiverse um, of dimensions that impinge on looking at this problem of climate change. And I use some terminology um, that I take from Bruno Latour, and I will come back to Bruno Latour. So first is, of course, what we need if we talk about the problem of climate change is to make reference to what's happening out there through models, through satellites, through measurements, through science. So that's the very important um, ch challenge that we have, task that we have to understand, um, to get information um, about a problem. Secondly, we have to recognize that it's not just science that can help us think through um, what climate change means. Um, 
we need many other registers. And one of them is fiction. Thinking through how does life look in 2050, in 2070, in 2090, under different scenarios, you may say, of climate change. Metamorphosis is more the psychological element of the whole question. Um, consumerism is something that captures us. And are there ways, can we think of ways um, to have global met metamorphosis in terms of our, our culture? Of course, morality comes into play in many different ways. Emissions have been, um, I think, caused up till now largely um, by a particular set of countries. The effects are largely happening in another set of countries. Already there, you can see the big moral elements, the big ethical elements um, in climate change. Politics, another dimension that comes into play. Politicians, sometimes people say they are elected every four years. It means they can't deal um, with climate change. Politics is about dealing with uncertainty and with the right narratives. It should be possible to also deal with 2050, 2070, 2090, also in politics. Law is an instrument, is a dimension that has a very important role in climate change, an increasingly important role as we see through all sorts of legal ways, their legal means. Um, to hold societies to account. In order to deal with the challenge of climate change, we need a great deal of organization and other dimension of reality that Latour calls another mode of existence. We need new technology, of course. But I think, and that's what triggered also um, the title and the research, we also need another fresh look at the role of religion in a very wide meaning of the word in order to talk about climate change. And my claim in a sense is this is a kind of a reading group on science and religion. My claim is that the book that Bruno Latour has written, um, in, uh, he published it in, in French in 2015, um, on, on Gaia, facing Gaia, is a very important um, is a very important work uh, to think through climate change. Um, and what I bring in a sense to the table is in addition to having a particular philosophical interest uh, in terms of how, how we think through um, philosophy in terms of what we can know and the nature of reality. And I will, I will end on that with my proposal that I developed in my book on transcendental naturalism. I also bring a very practical experience of having been on behalf of the Dutch government, a delegate to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is, I think, a fascinating example of where many different dimensions that I just discussed come together in a forum. This is the forum that the world uses to establish what we know and what we don't know about climate change. But all these different elements play a role in how those negotiations take place. So you have a large room, all the countries there ordered in alphabetical order, a podium which kind of represents the state of the science, there's lobby groups from industry to uh, the environment that uh, run around and try to influence how the science on climate change is summarized. Many people have thought this is not a good idea. I think it is a very good idea to have the scrutiny of what the scientists bring to bear about what we know about not only the problem of climate change, but increasingly about the different options and solutions to climate change. They're very political and you cannot just leave that to the scientists not being scrutinized. The way it works, um, I won't go into detail, but it's a fascinating process. And in, in my book, I highlighted some, some examples of that, of how experts come together. They come up with very carefully crafted wording. Um, then there's a hundred pages of comments from governments. And then every sentence has to be agreed by all the governments of the world of how we represent the state uh, of knowledge on climate change. I've had the pleasure, this is uh, one of the, this was a 2013 meeting in Stockholm of being part of the delegation uh, of a government and negotiating there. What I've learned from that is that in those negotiations, in terms of how the science on climate is represented, and this is not just the science on the physical 
uh, science uh, side of the climate, but also on uh, the impacts of climate change and how to adapt as well as how to mitigate in terms of the CO2 concentrations. What you see happening there in actual life mode is hybrid networks between different governments and different scientists trying to find out what is a diplomatically acceptable way um, for everyone um, to represent um, what both represent what the scientists um, can agree on in terms of how to phrase it, as well as all the different interests that are at play can agree on. And a lot of emotion and psychology is playing a role there as well. But the interesting element, the observation that also comes from Latour is that at the end, there is a report. The United Nations had written a report that represents nature, which is then taken apart from um, let's say a politics um, and, and and larger culture, and this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that um, that Latour has observed in his, his, his earlier book. We've never been modern. Now I've looked into the nitty gritty details of doing science. I've done my own kind of climate science work. Uh, used computers like this. Uh, wrote uh, a first doctorate. It's a very simple and funny story why there are three doctorates now. I won't go into much detail, but the second doctorate, um, which followed on from the first in climate science, was a philosophical doctorate, and I was hired as a postdoc. Um, but in the Dutch system, it was beneficial for the university to get a funding for having the book also submitted as a doctoral thesis. So that was just a very simple budgetary um, reason to have it submitted. Uh, as a thesis again. Um, but what I did was I wrote um, a book on how uncertainties in these scientific models that are made on the physical sciences of uh, the physical side of climate change, um, how those are uh, assessed, what they really are, um, and how they are dealt with in this intergovernmental panel on climate change, which later got published um, as a book as well. Now, the link to the last book that I've written, um, the seeds of that are also in, in the IPCC experience. So I was there in um, one of the um, uh, negotiations where one country said, Mother Earth is not in the report. And then the scientists were often kind of shocked and the different countries were thinking, yeah, well, of course, Mother Earth is not in the report. But that country insisted that Mother Earth needs to be in the report. And for one reason or, what, or, or, or another, I became the chair of the co-chair of the contact group, which had to resolve this issue. And I learned a lot from that. It was really interesting. I, I saw there how difficult, now this is Mother Earth is a concept that's embodied in, uh, in laws in, um, in, in Bolivia and, and Ecuador, and is really a serious element of, um, of environmental law where you recognize that um, humans and ecosystems are not, are not separate. Um, and the most that the scientists could do, they said, well, we don't have publications in the sciences that talk about Mother Earth, but we can give a, represent a representation in the summary of the report where we say indigenous, local and traditional knowledge systems and practices, including indigenous people's holistic view of community and environment are a major resource for adapting to climate change but these have not been used consistently in existing adaptation efforts. Now, that's a very weak way and a very instrumental way to talk about indigenous um, and local knowledge and Mother Earth um, wasn't mentioned here. So I found this very intriguing to understand the clash, in a sense, between indigenous populations and, and modernity in a way. Another example I encountered in a project I did in Southeast Asia, where we studied how the Dutch rational future planning delta management, uh, looking 100 years in the future um, and planning for the delta and the delta works that are needed under different scenarios of climate change. How that approach landed perfectly in Vietnam, it's an export product, it landed perfectly in Myanmar, it landed perfectly in Bangladesh, it did not land in Thailand. And we went into some detail of why was it so difficult in Thailand. And one of the things we learned there was actually Thailand has never been colonized. 
and its public administration has not been the same kind of modernist approach that the other countries had implemented. And there was actually an idea of Thai Buddhist kingship in Thai um, public administration, which made it really difficult for them to follow that Dutch approach. I won't go into much more detail, but it's another example where I saw this link um, between um, yeah, different views on, 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 on the role of religion in a sense, in a, in a wide sense, um, and, uh, and science. I also have become, in 2018, um, the editor-in-chief of a journal on the topic of religion and science. And bringing that all together, um, even before I became the editor-in-chief, um, I decided I need to write a book about this. Um, I, need to, I wanted to understand more. Um, about this clash between, um, for instance, indigenous life worlds um, and modern science. Um, but doing that actually as an exercise in, in, um, in, in philosophy um, itself, although it was formerly a thesis in theology, uh, in, in a sense it became, um, it became really a philosophical uh, approach that, uh, that I developed on the basis of three philosophers. And I will tell you um, a bit about that. But first, Latour, the, the main um, kind of author that I first really engaged with to understand climate change. And Latour is an author um, who has written really interesting books um, over many decades. Um, he died last summer. Um, so in the 70s, he worked on how in scientific laboratories facts are constructed. Um, he had a major work in 87 called Science in Action where he kind of laid down the principles of how you can really follow scientists and engineers through society. And I make a big jump, there are many books in between. Um, I'm here focusing on the book that I really found both challenging and important, his book of 2013, a very thick book, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence and Anthropology of the Moderns, which I think is a, is a crucial work also for understanding this book, Facing Gaia. And I will say more about Facing Gaia, uh, about the different chapters and what, what Latour is actually saying there. And Latour has then also had was challenged to become even more concrete on what his thinking um, meant uh, for climate. So on these eight chapters in that book, I can really recommend it. It has been translated in many languages, including Dutch. Um, and um, just... The highlights from the different chapters um, before I make the move to, to what I did in my book. So he highlights, we should be very careful to talk about the climate crisis because a crisis even suggests that we can, can, we can get through it. He's not very optimistic, to be honest. Um, in terms of the term nature has a very central role in, in, in all these discussions. Um, I try to come up with a version of what's called naturalism, which is really, is really triggered by how Latour speaks um, about nature, but he didn't use the term naturalism for that, um, but indicating very clearly that man belongs to nature, um, that if you talk about nature versus culture, you take a very particular cut out of a larger world, um, which you don't necessarily need to do. Um, if you still want to do some, some naturalizing by mixing, in a sense, um, the de facto and the, the, the kind of the normative, the de, de jure, um, you should do that really carefully. And actually, my book is about how you do that really carefully, this, this, this mix. Um, and specifically about climate scientists, um, he says some, some, some really, uh, inspiring things in terms of uh, climate scientists don't be afraid of politics get involved um, but you have to be very conscious of how you do that you cannot just say I speak for nature and there's a whole discussion about what that means and then he brings up this figure of Gaia um, which then replaces nature um, I'll say more about that um, and for chapter three in his chapter two is uh, so he had he gave six lectures and he expanded it into his book into eight um this chapter two is focused on be careful um for climate activists to say everything is certain because that's not really gonna 
going to mobilize uh, in terms of getting politicians um, to uh, to work. If you want to do politics, you have to get groups behind you. And it's not enough to say science tells us we need to do A or B. A second thing which is uh, important um, from that from that lecture is really that um, this whole idea of separating nature from the human uh, of the, uh, the nature uh, making uh, nature not animated in a sense um, and making it non-human it's a very kind of uh, following he says it is an interesting theological analysis um, of yeah attributing both certainty to god and then that's that same kind of model gets trans, trans transferred into nature in a sense so the inspiration for natural sciences comes from a particular view on um on religion um and then about gaia he already says this is not about um giving it uh, the earth a soul which uh, of course some people in uh, gaia is a goddess so this is uh it's it's really important to realize how he wants to use uh, the word um and he and he emphasizes that we have to really um, take account of the agency and the history um, of the earth the third chapter it's um about about gaia and um again emphasizing that there's nothing spiritual about this um he's actually emphasizing this is very secular very worldly it's a very important term he uses worldly term um and he says we have to learn to participate as humans also in the geohistory of the planet we come we re really have become part of it um and and he emphasizes that we need to do some way of naturalizing which i've kind of taken up by also keeping the term um that we uh, we need a particular sort of naturalism in philosophy and fight against um scientific naturalism and i'll get back to that um, and what that means the term anthropocene uh, is used and also as a he's critical of the term the globe um so he says be very careful that with the anthropocene that it doesn't mean that we now suddenly have a uh, a magic way to have one political constituency to solve the global problems um we actually are faced and that's what i saw with this example of mother earth for instance and some countries bringing that up in indigenous populations we have many contradictory interests competing territories and uh, those are brought together by warring agencies not to say warring divinities so it's not it's not a nice world out there necessarily um and the globe uh thinking about the globe uh, trying to put it all uh on a map in a sense is a he analyzes that as a platonic obsession which is transferred into christian theology and has then been deposited in political epistemology um the fifth chapter um i can summarize that in terms of his analysis of the science and religion discussion a kind of he didn't engage very much with that but he actually says here then if we were to try to separate science and religion today um from the vantage point of the anthropocene it would be a real massacre given how much science there is in religion how much religion there is in science and here is a table from um from his book where he analyzes very classical images of science that are all about certainty and laws of nature coupled to a very classical image of um religion about ordering god he says we need to move from those what he calls natural religions to a terrestrialization where he has another notion of nature which i very much endorse um which is about um, a multiverse and also another image of religion which he says this is actually what re religion um is uh the, the kind of uh what he calls counter religion is re should be really about um and it is then also about um not to put an end to the end of times is a way he says it um so what he does in a in a in a way is uh, emphasize his third point here um he emphasizes that in religion as he wants to kind of propagate it um it's all about uncertainty it's all about there is uncertainty whether we have reached 
um, uh, the end of times. And we should actually not just, um, let's say, uh, assume that um, it has already happened and nothing, nothing matters uh, anymore. We always keep this uncertainty but it's also not something that's going to happen in future. So it's a very, it's very interesting theological argument. He started as a, as a, as a theologian uh, in a, in a sense, and he comes back full circle in his book on uh, climate. The seventh chapter is really about making clear that he doesn't want to get back to some Arcadian view. Um, and in a way he says, it's not gonna be nice and pretty, we cannot believe in the old future if we want to have a future at all. And that's what he means by facing Gaia. And then the last chapter um, is about how to govern uh, these uh, these territories. And he emphasizes, in a sense, we should not appeal to totality. Um, and he's looking for a kind of civic cult um, for dealing with planetary boundaries. And inspired by his notion earlier, also in his book, with never be modern on a parliament of things um he really endorses approaches where people represent not only people but also um elements um like oceans or indigenous populations not only countries in uh, kind of negotiations on the future of the planet now what i did in my book i had a couple of chapters there three chapters where i tried to engage with latour's facing gaia book um, and framed it as that he identified three problems of modernity, and one of them was religious disenchantment um, of nature, where I kind of analyze using a couple of books um, that in the field of science and religion, there are very important discussions um, on the role of poetics. And in a sense, also thinking through how dealing with climate change um, how you can relate, how you can kind of energize uh, people uh, create to create modern myths, myths on the basis of uh, of science and also what the limitations are there. So there's a whole dimension there to be studied, uh, which is related to poetics. And another problem of modernity is that there is a scientific disbelief in a plurality of value-laden perspectives. And an example is um, if you talk about scientific advice, um, typically um, they're starting for consensus of one expert, but there is so many different experts with very different um, views um, and not enough realization of the uncertainties of their different views um, that the question of who has authority and how, you, how do you deal with that needs revisiting. And there's a couple of works here um, on how rationality works. Um, in practice, that is very useful uh, to really think this through. And finally, a third problem of modernity that looked at was that it's so hard in public policy and planning to incorporate non-modern worldviews. So we're thinking again of this example um, of um, um, Mother Earth. Um, why is it so difficult? And how can we how can we talk about the future and be more open? Um, to different modes um, of thinking about the future. And there's very important works that are relevant there as well, including thinking about uh, mysticism. Um, so I had done studies on, on Buddhist uh, decision-making in Thailand, for instance. But I discovered also that Bruno Latour, in his work, didn't focus so much on this option of um, thinking about mysticism. Now, um, about naturalism, and then I want to lay out what then was the position that that I developed on the basis of three philosophers, and then we have uh, time for interaction. Looking forward to to some of your questions and reaction. I know there's a lot um, I want to cover. So this term naturalism, I want to define it here um, as um, is opposed, in a sense, to supernaturalism. Supernaturalism is there is a a being somewhere outside of nature. And that being can causally influence the world. Um, and there's no way um, you can underpin that, uh, that kind of interaction uh, by any um, kind of reliable epistemic um, methods. Now, I would say that 
a particular notion of um uh, so i think it's healthy in a sense to be a naturalist but there has been a problem with the way uh, that naturalism that has been developed has been too scientific and that's kind of latour's analysis as well um and so the other approach that i then now um highlight um doesn't suffer from it so i propose that we would need in philosophy if under climate change um but also more generally in terms of um also um philosophy and interreligious discussions we need a transcendental naturalistic approach and there are two important elements here so one is naturalism which is we do have to respect the methods and claims of science um but you must not succumb to scientism and that means that you only have science that can lead to knowledge um that's one element of the approach the other element is that there are values um but you cannot derive certainty from those values being there and those values a priori values that um that exists which are ideal and not real uh, but they are not supernatural and that's a crucial element um here in in philosophy to not fall in all sorts of platonic traps um and but you still have to admit those values as an element of ontology and epistemology now I will, i'll say a little bit more about that um william james is then an author that latour very much um emphasizes he um he he kind of um, makes use of also through um alfred north whitehead he brought to bear um and, uh, on, on the philosophy that we discuss here a very radical empiricism uh, pragmatism is another kind of label for an element of his philosophy what he emphasizes is um you have to look at practices if you look in, at, at at what's happening in culture and you have to realize that judgments are fallible now Rickert, a german philosopher also had a sort of empiricism but that um, he has also labeled that transcendental empiricism what he emphasized was yes we have these different judgments but um what also is important is that they are guided by values and they are realized in cultures in fallible ways and here is an example of a table that he included in his 1921 book of all the different domains of values so let the upper left is science and we have aesthetics in the middle and we have mystics um, on the left hand side the bottom but and we have ethics erotics and um, philosophy of religion on the right hand side those are all elements uh, of culture um different value domains then latour has what you could call um an occasionalist empiricism he focuses very much then also on empirical field studies ethnography to observe what values you can find in cultures he doesn't really want to use the term culture in that sense and also not necessarily values always but what he shows is a very similar table of many different domains in culture and i showed a few when i started my presentation when talking about climate change uh, mode of reference mode of fiction mode of technology mode of religion mode of organization morality um how you can look at all these different dimensions um of uh, reality which in my terminology all represent different values that can be realized um, in culture this then leads in the end to different possible religious outlooks if you uh, adopt such a transcendental naturalistic approach it's a kind of a philosophy that says um you can do philosophy and you try to get as far as you can but you have to stop at the point where it becomes metaphysics because there you have you just don't have the philosophical tools to prove your point which then means that you can stay open to different religious positions theistic atheistic agnostic and they are all consistent then with that philosophical approach it's a very Kantian approach but somewhat more uh, open and um, um, evolved and not with the metaphysical assumptions that Kant still had at the end of the 18th century so this is where this could be applied on climate change and then in the final five minutes um I want to kind of make my seven claims um that I develop in the seven chapters um of the book and one chapter is about wonder um where I emphasize that the emotion of wonder 
that facilitates a positive reading of uncertainty and intimations of metaphysical transcend uh, transcendence. So I analyze particular practices in science for instance, people who are working on uh, the theory of everything or quantum mechanics in the early days, and they feel that they are intimating a metaphysical transcendence. So there's a link with mystics there um, as well. On judgment and what is judgment, I really analyze that as an aesthetically felt freedom um, that you have when you arrive at judgment. But there's always uncertainty attached to determining what is the a priori value contribution to judgment? Then coming to values, I analyze values as themselves part of nature in my very expensive notion of nature. Um, the, the, in terms of that, uh, yeah, the world is very large and it, it includes values and they are assumed in judgments. And then uncertainty arises in the various cultural practices when you make value-related judgments under freedom and in context. Um, so you, those values, you can never be certain really that you, that you reach them. Then on models, that's really important that you arrive at models, um, as a step, uh, to, to bring your kind of, to reach concepts in a sense, in different practices in science and religion, you have, you need to have models, um, but you shouldn't interpret them realistically, um, other than a very weak form of what I call referential realism um so in experience you have um both perception and but you also create concepts but there is always going to be uncertainty that remains attached to the concepts then the three chapters uh, that i uh, highlighted before one on poetics and my claim there is poetics are available to read meaning including religious meaning in the world via judgment under uncertainty i have on authorities I claim that you have to have a plurality of cognitive authorities that you have to recognize in any practice, including that of science. So if you arrive at an expert judgment under uncertainty, for instance, in the IPCC, it has to be acknowledged to be a value-laden exercise. And then finally, on futures, my claim is really that futures must be kept open in politics under uncertainty, and you have to break, and you have to break through that uh, there is a disregard in two-way disregard between um, modern planning and science on the one hand and non-modern worldviews on the other hand. Now, this was just to give you a flavor in a sense of um, what Latour triggered in, in me in terms of wanting to um, analyze his work and understand also his large um his large book on ontology in a sense and and values um in terms of kind of basic philosophers that i think are important both turn of the 20th century they were active william james and heinrich Rickert. um and i hope in a few months time the book will be accepted and then it will be published and then you can all read it for free that's the beauty i submitted it to ucl press which is the first university press um, in the UK that publishes things um, open access. So uh, nobody has to buy the book, but you can just uh, all download it, uh, read it. And if you really, really, really want a printed copy, of course, they're happy to do that at HR. Sure. Um, so with that, Bethany, I hand it back to you and uh, we have uh, have some time for uh, Q&A and thinking through what climate change means for philosophy. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Uh, as, as Professor Peterson mentioned, we now have some time for Q&A. So if you are able to and you have a question you'd like to ask, please go down to the reactions bar at the bottom and simply raise a digital hand. You'll see a little bar that says raise your hand and then we can call on you. If you would really prefer that your question be asked anonymously, please choose the uh, hosts or co-hosts as the people you are uh, writing to in the chat, but the preference is that people raise your hand. So let me take uh, Chair's privilege and, and begin. I really enjoyed that um, and uh, found it really fascinating in terms of the sort of difficulties that that of course modernity has in trying to to address the the issues that modernity raises. So of course it makes sense to say we need something other than this to to deal with the problems. 
My question is, if your book is successful, it comes out, it's widely read, people adopt it. Um, how, how many people do you think need to make a change like that for there to be a tipping point in terms of policy? So if you're thinking of the delegates room at, at, at the IPCC there, where, how, how fully do people need to adopt a new sort of naturalism um, and and to what scale do we need these kinds of changes in in light of the pressing pressures of climate change? That's a difficult one. Um, because sometimes I think we need philosopher kings. Um, so you just need a few who understand it. Um, and then I actually correct myself and um, and think it's so important if all of us in our education get exposed to the issues in modernity and ways we can talk about it where we still keep what we have gained in modernity um in uh in in, in let's say in some esteem um and that's a very difficult kind of trick so what i try to do is i throw a very a, a hyper-modernist kind of philosopher like Henri Rickert, who really recognizes what the limitations are at kind of the problem, and then with Latour, who is kind of way beyond that, um, and try to keep Latour a little bit in check, say, hey, you're throwing away too much. Don't throw away the baby with the bathwater in your philosophy. Um, so I ended a very subtle position, which means, um, um, in a way, there is a place for many philosophies and many ways of thinking through the world um, in, in, um, um, in thinking through climate change. So in creating that openness in itself, I think it's just a very methodological piece. It itself, the book won't be read by more than a hundred people. I think I'm not, it's how it is in life. I'm not telling the publisher that, um, but, uh, or maybe a bit more, but it's more like, um, through different practices um, and creating a new bachelor's program um, together with colleagues uh, at UCL, where actually the basic ideas of the book are ingrained in the program. But yeah, just have 15 students coming in this year, right? So it's the first year. So it will still not change the world. Um, so yeah, it's a, the motto of our faculty here. I'm a professor of engineering, as you may know, in a sense. So the motto is change the world. And we have a course, how to change the world. Well, it's in small steps, it's very small steps, but yes, it is, a, the ambition is large with the book and what it, uh, what it could mean, would mean, but I don't believe that too many people should engage with the arcane philosophical details that make me tick in this book. Thank you. We're just coming to the end of our time here, so I'm going to post a uh, a link in the chat that is for registering for the next meeting of the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Uh, that will be on Monday, the 27th of February from 6 to 7 here in the UK. And that evening, we will be hearing from Do Dr. Stan Rosenberg on the question, can nature be read in tooth and claw in the thought of Augustine? So you can find full details and uh, the ability to register there. So uh, it is left to me to thank Professor Peterson for a wonderful lecture. We look forward to the book and thank you all to, uh, for coming and for uh, participating in this forum. So let's show our thanks either by clapping or uh, using the reactions buttons down below. So thank you very much.